Hello, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be here with you all for the IBC EMENA podcast. Uh, my name is Alex Malouf. Um, I'm on the IBC EMENA board, and today we've got a fantastic webinar looking at the digital content space. Uh, we're joined uh, by a very special speaker. I've heard a lot about Rob. Uh, Rob Dumbleton, he is director for 27 Partners and also for StoryShare. StoryShare is the Center the development platform, um, which uh, you'll learn more about. And 27 Partners is a London-based creative technology company. Um, Rob has worked uh, a number of organizations, uh, including Accenture um, and also as well a management consultant in the North Highland company. Um, with that, I think, Rob, you tell the story much better than I do. I'm going to hand over to you. But before that, we will have questions at the end. And you can use the question box, and I'll be reading them out. So Rob, over to you. Alex, thank you. Um, great introduction and and, uh, and no pressure. So I do, I do hope it's interesting for everybody. Um, just before we start, yeah, I, I want to introduce myself and, and, and what we do. Um, Rob Dumpton is the director here at 27 Partners. Um, we're, a, as Alex said, a creative technology company that look at bringing the experiences we're all used to at home, outside of work in our daily lives, into the workplace. And I'll put our mantra up here on the screen so I hope you can all, all see that. The fact that we do live in this world of fantastic experience, fantastic technology, but when we go to work, that all seems to stop. And I think there's this huge disparity being created between the consumer market and the workplace environment. And how do we bring those further together? And I think with the rise of cloud computing, this is totally possible. And there's so many opportunities for us as communicators to get better digital experiences created inside our organizations that, of course, deliver that fantastic digital content. So we really started 27 Partners that long ago, uh, six years ago, um, to, to really provide that employee experience and the technology that comes with that, but also to focus on uh, digital behaviors and the psychology of how people consume content, how content is delivered across the world to a multitude of people in our very large organizations that we're all part of. So what I wanted to do today was really introduce you to a few models and how we structure our logic when we're thinking about these types of challenges that we're often presented with by our, our customers. And obviously, you know, I can't, I can't go into these in a huge amount of detail uh, today, but I'm going to give you a little flavor. And then if you'd like more, then I'm always available to be contacted uh, offline after we've, uh, after we've gone through the, the presentation. So I thought I'd just um, summarize what we tend to hear when we engage with our customers in the content and communications and engagement space, what everyone's saying. And, and, and first of all, what, what's often talked about is either there's too much content out there, there's too much white noise, everything gets lost, or there's not enough of the right stuff. And that's really where moving away from analog and becoming more digital is the focus but more importantly people can't seem to find that content you know i've spoken to customers who've told me they have seven different intranets inside their organization that no one can find the content on each one and it's not necessarily about consolidating those things it's about creating these veneers on top for you to surface that information surface that content and make sure that people can find it the second piece i guess is, is about the the content that's actually created and, and we tend to find and we tend to see a lot of the time content's actually created for the organization and, and what I mean by that is that everything is merged into this amorphous blob of, of a you know a single persona and let's target our content just at the organization rather than thinking about the audience nuances that need to be accounted for across the organization and really down to that individual level. Think of the disparity again between the types of people that you have within your organizations right now and actually what messages do they need to receive? Why do they need to receive certain information? How do they need to engage with different levels of content? Because they're not going to consume the same stuff. And the other, I think, key, key problem or key opportunity, area of opportunity that we see 
is that the user experiences that we're providing for our people to then consume content is, is poor and it's not relevant. Things like clunky intranets that already exist, that have been built for, uh, you know, the desktop are being trying, people are trying to cram those into a mobile view and it, it just doesn't work. Or lots of content dumped on social channels. So you just get this overload like you have in the consumer space. And it's hard to sift through everything. It's hard to determine what's relevant and what's not if there's lots of stuff in there. And also, of course, fake news. If you, if you relinquish too much control over what you are broadcasting, what you're sending out, then you might have a problem that it's not authentic, it's not actually real, it's someone's opinion. So I think in summary, I, I feel, and I don't know whether people on this call feel, that there is a content problem that exists inside large organizations. So targeting relevant people wherever they are is the key to success. And I'm gonna to talk to you a lot about today about reach and how to get uh, how, how to get content out to those hard to reach people, because that's really what our, as communicators, our objective is within the organization, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to why. Um, but I think, again, a lot of, a lot of focus is, is on the, the corporate level content, is on the ivory tower versus those who probably need it, need it most. And what you get then is a disengagement from the workforce that's hard to reach because they're not being engaged with, they're not being connected with. And then it, this creates a gulf in behavior so it becomes an us v them with corporate and, and the everyday worker. And I think that's really where I encourage our clients to start to consider who their forgotten workers are and what their behaviors are, how this dictates their content consumption. Because I think more and more, and, and today with flexible working and the way businesses are evolving and people are more mobile, people are out and about, they're on the move, they're time poor, for example, they might be working part time. So you need to make sure that the content matches those individuals, those personas that exist across the organization. And you know, things like long form content written by ex-journalists probably won't work for someone who is consuming little snippets of content on the go, on the move, when they have a bit of time. And we've, we know some stats from across the industry as well that 55% more people year on year are consuming content on their mobile devices versus their laptops, versus their PCs. That's happening in the consumer market. And the challenge, I guess, to you guys out there is, and, and I'll be talking a lot more about this, is understanding your enterprise data and what people are actually doing and fitting your strategy to that. So who in your organization, how are people currently consuming your content? Do you know, do you have the mechanism in place to understand whether people are consuming content on mobile versus uh, a web browser on their on their laptop or their desktop. And the other thing is, we do a lot of work in emerging markets, and emerging markets don't tend to have laptops and desktops. They are all mobile based. So there is a, a key theme here, here and, there, and there will be a key theme throughout this of getting content to the right people, right place, right time, and right device. But that will also influence what type of content you need to think about producing and creating in the first place so that you can make any communication program a success. Just to give you a bit of a flavor of, of what I'm talking about, because we have actually measured our average content consumption times. It does happen to be across two different organizations, but I wanted to show you this because these two groups are massively different in terms of the, the products that we have or the digital channels that we have rolled out uh, across these two organizations. On the one hand, you've got Unilever, where we have uh, emerging market salespeople who, who don't have terminals, so they are all mobile based and have quite basic language skills, so you have to translate the content. Their average viewing time or consumption time per session of content is only 90 seconds. I say only 90 seconds, that's not too bad because we know they're on there most days. Whereas a, a service we have at Covestro, because they are scientists and research teams, they're interested in R&D, they're more desk-based and, and more highly educated, so they're more likely to consume more content, especially uh, in the written form. Their average session times are three minutes, 36 seconds. So to understand your audiences and how they're consuming, what time they are giving to your channels will dictate the content that you release through those channels. You know, you wouldn't, for example, in the Unilever case, put five minute videos out 
or five minute articles for people to read because they just won't spend the time. So keeping those, keeping that content nice and snackable and bite sized, but making sure it links in a series would therefore be the recommendation. And I think really what it's all about for me and where I'm trying to steer all the conversations I'm having with the, with the organization, sending content or uh, engaging with individuals and allowing them to consume is all about understanding their behaviors. Because when they do that, they're relinquishing a small bit of information about themselves to us as the organization. So we can monitor their behaviors, we can understand what they're interested in, what they're not, what they're spending time on. And this means we can better serve them and give them what they need. So this is elevating communications as a function far higher i think to be part of this bigger movement towards understanding our talent understanding our people and having a say right when 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 there's uh c-suite conversations on on actually what makes people tick and what do people need and where are we lacking in certain uh, bits of information to be able to stand up and say actually we've got proof of what is and what is not working because we've measured that so it's all about that that workforce insight and adapting our programming and, and what we send to those people based on their needs. And, and this is the beauty of digital content is the fact we can easily measure what people are clicking on, what they're consuming, what they're sending to each other, what they're commenting on. So you can start to build this very authentic and real picture in real time of what your audience is like. And I'm gonna ask you guys today to really think like a broadcaster. So I think this is very, very important of how the big broadcasters that you see out there behave. They do a lot of research. They have this constant feedback loop where they're adapting their programming. They're creating series uh, of, of, of themed content. Even in the papers, there's always a theme that you go through because they know people are reading and responding uh, to that content. But actually, you know, when, when, when we do think like a broadcaster, we've got to think about internally, how can we keep uh, adapting our messaging, uh, curating our content and making sure that it lands with the right people. And I thought I'd give you a, an example of, of where broadcasters are doing this very well. Now, I, I can see, obviously you can't see anyone nodding on the, on the line, but um, I hope, well, perhaps people haven't, but heard of the, the, C, the Netflix uh, uh, season called Stranger Things, which is about uh, a group of kids in the 80s who discover this parallel universe. Now, the reason this program was set in that era and was released when it was, was because Netflix were monitoring their search and what people were searching for. And it happened that people were searching for the 80s cult classic, The Goonies, on Netflix. And of those people that were searching for The Goonies, they were also watching TV series. So actually merging the two together with the same kind of theme and the fact that it was series based, so to keep people coming back for more week on week, day on day, whenever whenever they would like to consume that, Netflix actually created um, uh, Stranger Things to align to that. So an interesting question, and again, this is perhaps something that people can answer at the end of this webinar, is who on this call has actually analyzed their search history, their enterprise search history, to validate what their people really want. Now, you might not have the right system in place to do this, and you might not be able to analyze those search terms, but I really encourage everybody to start thinking that way because it's going to, it's going to happen, and actually the right system will allow you to get that kind of insight so you can validate what people search for. You can validate what they went, then went on to consume, and rather than assume that they want to see certain bits of content, that audience, that even that person, you can tailor your message to make it land. Because to be more targeted is far more efficient than to keep casting the, the broad net when it just, it just doesn't work. Kind of take, teaching you guys how to suck eggs here, but you, you must, must know your audience. And again, back to broadcasters, back to marketers, they spend a lot of time thinking about their audience, thinking about the differences in their audiences, differences in terms of how, <clears throat> how they will consume content, but also the style of programming. Different people want different things and have different priorities. So you have to make sure you tailor not only your messaging and the content that you're sending out there, but perhaps your user experience. Not everyone's going to like social channels. Not everyone's going to like print media. Different groups will have a different appetite for those things. 
but you must 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 make sure whatever experience you create it fits in with those individuals or those groups daily lives and their jobs because if it's too different to what they do on a day-to-day -day basis if they have to come away from the production line and log on to an intranet page on a on a web terminal within a factory they're not they're just not going to do that so you've got to get content to the people another question i want to pose to everybody is, is who's who's actually looked at the hr data they've got to understand what their their audience looks like because i think once you know this data you can use that employee record to track consumption to track test scores and then to aggregate all those trends together to really understand what do my different groups of people like what do they dislike how do they behave so you can start to then be a bit more again targeted and tailored with what you're releasing to them and you know it for example should have a lot of information on who in your organization is using what devices and when so that's a perfect starting point to look at device types and what people are using and to understand from your HR data what your distribution of employees are. But within those countries, for example, what type of demographics do you have? Now, this isn't um, going into the GDPR world at all because you're not uh, identifying individuals, you're identifying groups. And then you're trying to track group behavior and what those individuals are doing. And this is where it gets quite scientific and data driven. And I think I've seen a lot of stuff in uh, on LinkedIn and, and social media now talking about artificial intelligence and the future of AI and comms. And I, I don't believe that's a thing yet because until you have your data-driven approach, you can't do AI. Artificial intelligence needs to be taught. And the only way it can be taught is in having a legacy of information that sits behind it that indicates what the trends are, indicates those algorithms so that it can then apply its knowledge once you've trained it um, to then identify those nuances and differences and serve up different content. So I don't think we can start to talk or get too excited by the, the world of AI until we've got our house in order. We understand our audience. We understand how this is broken down. If we look at it from the other side as well, and we, we've done some um, projects with uh, a global law firm on this, um, to let let your people tell you what they want as well. Don't just assume that you're gonna send stuff down the funnel. And again, there are a lot of applications out there in the consumer space, audio boom, things like Spotify, where you can start dictating your preferences around certain topics. And this means that you're combining insights in the back end, so information that you can see with what consumers or what your audiences actually want to receive information and news on because they are interested in that. And this, of course, then gives those employees some choice as well. So I've just given you two examples of some onboarding screens that we have within one of our platform applications where individuals can actually go in and they can select their practice and their sectors, and that will serve up that content that's relevant to them. Because if you're not interested in things like finance and projects and HR, but you are interested in business services and restructuring, then actually that's the type of content we should be serving to you. Otherwise, it's just filling your inbox up, filling your uh, interface up with stuff that's not relevant that you're not going to read. And that people only have a finite amount of time to consume that content. So we want to make sure we get the most bang for our buck by giving people really what they need. This this slide here kind of summarizes really where I think the, I guess, general strategy of content creation needs to go. And you've probably all heard of the word agile being bounded about in the application development space. But I, I actually think it's probably more relevant for things like content because you are dipping your toe into your audience um, uh, uh, groups and seeing what they like, understanding and then adapting what you've got. So it's more of a cyclical process to get content into the right channels and the right device types. And you know, uh, mobile is a key lever in this change for consumption of content and measurement because people always have devices on them. But for me, and, and walking around this, you've got to ensure that you're getting the right content to the right people, so your targeted audiences, at the right time, so they're not always at their desks. So when are you gonna get that content to them? It could be on 
digital display screens, for example, in the in the canteen, but to make sure they can then track that back to some sort of online experience when they can do some further delving. And, and that's really on that right device. And then for us as professionals to be able to measure the success of that content consumption and then adapt it for the future. So we don't keep doing the same thing that might not be right, that might be wrong, that people will not adopt. So, you know, a classic example would be if you know people are consuming content on their mobile devices, then don't create huge infographics, right? Because people won't be able to see that. They won't be able to consume that on a phone. So these little, these little, um, I guess indicators, if you like, are, are really where we need to form this cyclical process. And this just keeps on going and it's round and round and round. It's different groups. And this is where we as professionals need to run a more cyclical process rather than the linear. We're going to throw stuff out and then we're going to do a survey at the end of six months to see how well our content stuck. We shouldn't have to survey our people because if we send the right content out to them and they are consuming and sharing and behaving in the right way, we can. that's our survey, to be quite honest. Now, <clears throat> there's a, I, I often show this, this cycle and it's not the most exciting of wheels, um, but I think it, it does a, a really solid job in helping people to understand that content management flow. So this is taking the previous slide in a bit more detail. And this is where we always talk about aligning your people, process and technology around these areas of the flow, because you will need different skills. You will need different uh, platforms and technology, for example, to ingest content. If you want to take great video content, maybe you'll need to think about cameras and encoders and how you get that in, into, your, um, into your system. And then, of course, processes that sit around there. So things like uh, approval workflow for content. And I'll come to the, the whole uh, crowdsourcing of content where that's, that's much um, uh, more prevalent in a minute. And this process is far easier now everyone's moving to the cloud because you do have the ability to have different people from all across the globe weighing in and approving workflow and, and logging into the right system, pressing the right buttons. Um, but actually, if we start off with strategy and development, for me, that that's where you, you really learn from the back of the process. So when that comes back round to you, that's where that strategy keeps on evolving um, and then doesn't stay the same and, and will be very different depending on, again, environmental impacts, what's going on outside of work, all those things. So you have to keep that fluid and then into, into content production and actually submitting that into a system, into a content management system where you can store and manage all your content in one single place and how easy is that for people to submit content? If you have a problem, for example, with not getting enough content, well, you need to create an, a, an easy way for your uh, almost enterprise journalists, people that exist across your organization to submit content, to be able to submit something that just needs to be approved and then published. And it's not always the social channels because that gives anyone any voice. This is curated content. This is targeted content. Uh, and this is managed content. And then you need that entire governance process because you need to make sure the content's tagged correctly so people can find it. You need to make sure that content is then distributed, so federated out into the right channels. Take content to the people. And again, we always talk about having con a content management system in one place, it doesn't matter where that content then ends up in terms of being distributed or, or even presented in terms of the experience because you've always then got a link back to that central core where all your content is kept, where that's all managed, but it has to be a, a system that can cope with digital assets, with media assets and not just documents. And this is where we evolve slightly uh, on from things like Microsoft SharePoint, because that's not quite what that's designed for. Actually, a media asset management system is slightly different, but it would allow you to get that reach. It would allow you to get in, almost your tentacles out in, as a, you know, like an octopus into those different channels across the organization and then surface your content there where people can consume it, but you can still measure that content consumption and where it was consumed. So uh, a prime example would be salespeople spend a lot of time in Salesforce if you have salesforce.com or a similar CRM. Now, if they have a chat function in, in Salesforce, like Salesforce Chatter, then it's probably worth you putting a lot of content inside that channel because that's where they are. That's where they live. So to be able to then embed content in those channels but then draw people back out as and when they want more 
rather than say, if you want to come and read this, you've got to come into our channel, that's going to break down that those barriers of interchange between channels and across channels. Um, but of course, the the start of the strategy and, and really the development and, and why we create content in the first first instance has to be because there's a business need, and I'll, I'll come to that uh, in, in a sec. And the next uh, uh, flow I wanted to show you is, is more about the the whole broadcast system because we're we're getting a lot of requests from our customers at the moment on how best to crowdsource content, how best to crowdsource information, materials. Um, and this is not just let's just dump it in one place and everyone go and find it themselves. This is how can we um, uh, promote more employee journalism so we can get people to actually write articles, to do podcasts, to do videos, but then removing the barriers for them to do that in the first place, but then submitting those into a central, and as I've already said, media asset management, digital asset management, and content management system, similar to how the broadcasters work, because they have uh, journalists and, and you know, cameramen and, and, uh, and, and uh, new, uh, individuals who, who um, go and collect news in loads of different countries, they're all submitting their information to one single place. It doesn't just go live. It's not just posted on social media. Everything flows through that central broadcast arm and then is displayed in the correct place on the correct machine. But then always when, once that information or once that content has been displayed to then get a reaction, to make people act, to have, start having a conversation about that content. You know, that's the idea is to not have just passive content that just flows out and people go, oh, OK, I mean, that was relatively interesting. There must be a so what. There must be a go tell us what you think. And then that joins that cycle right back up because then you can get content hanging off the last bit of content that you've created because it's of a series. So it's people's reactions to, for example, financial results. Because that would be great to see if companies did more of that. Okay, what was the uh, I know sales leader's re reaction to the CFO announcing that the share price had gone down, or you know the the quarterly targets were were missed? Okay, well let's let's hear from the people that we as individuals within that department uh, are more inspired by and look up to, rather than someone who actually you know we 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 don't really have that much of a rapport with. Um, so this is this is more of a, I guess, a broadcast system, but this is what we're trying to create, this kind of process inside organizations to make that process easier and to give comms a bit more control over what goes out and what gets out there. And I think we're in danger as, as uh, comms professionals of giving too much control to social channels where lots of information just flows out from lots of people who want to have a voice. We want to identify the interesting people inside organizations who have a voice and allow them to submit content, allow them to go out and become journalists. And, and just an interesting case study that, that we've, we've worked on and, and uh, a company that we greatly admire is the Wells Fargo Bank in the US had a video system that they put in place about, it's about nine years ago now actually. Um, and they gave, the ability to create content to all their employees. So you could upload any video you wanted. It was controlled in terms of then where those videos went. So they use this exact model that you can see right here. Um, but in, uh, content was submitted into the, into the central hub and that was looked at and curated. And they actually identified employees who were creating a lot of great content. A lot, you know, These are financial uh, employees, these were bankers. And those individuals actually became uh, broadcast employees after the first, I think, two years, where they actually ran uh, a series called Five at Five, where there was a five-minute live uh, broadcast session run by those people, those individuals who left being a banker to become an internal broadcast professional. But people would tune in to Five at Five because they knew there would be a brilliant summary of the day's events. They knew there'd be something funny, something interesting, uh, and it was from their peers. It wasn't necessarily from leadership. So a great way of identifying who's out there in your organization and who you can use. Now, I've, I've kind of talked you through a lot of systematic ways of thinking and a lot of flows in terms of uh, the content management cycle, but I wanted to just touch on the softer side of, of actually how we think about um, uh, 
structuring our messaging, structuring our engagement, structuring our, our communications with individuals. And um, myself and, and Mike Klein actually wrote an article on the internal comms matrix because where we've seen a lot of success in how to uh, pitch your, your technology, your content, your processes, how you structure your audiences are with these four pillars of inform, inspire, inquire and involve. And you know this is this is a, a an example starter for ten for people who are looking at revamping their entire communications uh, approach because actually if you start to think about the difference between an inform and inspire uh, model, you know your inform piece is more about your internal brand and corporate news or departmental news, and you will go to certain levels of depth based on that interest. So to create an uh, awareness of a topic versus understanding and, and, and all the way down to practice, you need to have three different levels or, of content and, and basically depth of content under there. And you might have to have different content based on your audience type. But of course, the informed piece is very different to the inspire. And this is where you want, might wanna think about key individuals and personal stories and, and make it a bit more human and we've seen this work very well with um, you know, CEOs and, and leaders out in the business, but also peers who actually are doing something inspirational and following their stories, um, because it gives people that, that kind of sense of belonging, sense of trust and, and, and ownership as well. So the inform and inspire pillars are, are, are very different. And then you must have, you must have action. So um, the inquire piece is all about how, to, uh, how people are reacting to content, um, and you know this is not just just surveys. It's 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 actually measuring how people are commenting and sharing and liking and and, and collaborating with each other around a specific piece of content. And then of course you've got to have the involved piece. So um, you know not just just have being passive. It's actually how can you get involved? How can we involve you in this process? How can we involve you in this initiative? And this is where people can actually take up take actions. And this is all about opening up those conversations. So we must, must, must get more conversations going within our communities, within our organizations around topics and not just have a one-way street for engagement and communications. Um, and this is really where this whole piece is meant to uh, bring that together and actually how we start to think about the people who are aware can then filter that down and, and have a bit more of a, you know, get a bit more of an understanding if they read on further. And if they're really interested in that topic, there should be more content, more information for them to consume in order to practice that and the practitioners can then filter back up uh, to the awareness side. So I've just got a, a couple more um, a, a couple more slides to take you guys through and I wanted to finish really on the whole experience piece because we talked a lot about content and yes content is absolutely part of your experience but also your digital user experiences. How you can create something internally that will make people uh, look up, will make people uh, take action and that will give you an edge over your competitors because off the shelf just doesn't work. Uh, all companies are different and everybody needs something that's slightly more tailored to their needs. But of course, if you're going to provide people with brilliant mobile experiences around engagement and consuming content, then you are competing for time. You're competing for people's attention and idle thumb time when they're on their phones. So what's to stop them clicking on something like Twitter or YouTube or Instagram? And that's where you really have to create something that's as good, if not better, than all of these things there. Because you want to actually, that's your real estate, that's your time that you want to capture. And even if you did a minute or, or 90 seconds a day, just in terms of informing people, so a little notification on their mobile phone, click on here for the latest update this morning, and maybe it's a 60 second synopsis of what's going on that's a huge win because you've people look people will start to then do that on their own accord you won't have to remind them but the answer for me is certainly not intranets i think intranets have a great place they're very transactional but this is where we start to think about our ecosystem of channels that we need to create to make sure that we get content to the people so very very quickly um I wanted to take you through a, a Unilever case study that, that we worked on because I think this is very prevalent to the communications and engagement uh, space. Now it's not, people. I don't think people would typically think that sales enablement's a communication task, but for me, 
you've got to be able to prove and show that you can achieve business goals as a communicator. So to be able to tie performance indicators, business outcomes to your initiatives is where you'll get sponsorship and you'll get budget to do things. Now, the business, as it stands, will come to the uh, cent central organization with a lot of challenges. And in this case, it was how do you actually engage a global workforce that are out there on the move, that are mobile, so that we can tell, we can uh, provide them with the right information so they know what to sell and they know how to sell wherever they are in the world. And this is a common problem across all organizations. It's again, right content, right people, right place, right time. This is a communications problem. So how do we solve that? And, and we actually created a uh, user experience for Unilever that was predicated on micro learning but also product information as well. So um, informing people and triggering people to actually go and take a learning journey is something that communications can have a huge role in. So if I release a bit of news or something interesting for people to look at, once they're in my channel, I can then lead them on a learning journey so they can start to then consume a bit more content. And this is where different departments need to come together to achieve a business goal. It's not comms does this, L&D does this. It should be, okay guys, well we need to engage this, this workforce that's hard to reach, that's out there, that's probably disengaged right now, high attrition rates, and the end goal is to engage them so that we can increase sales. Ultimately, we can increase sales, we can reduce attrition, we can keep these people within the company because once we train them, they are a valuable resource and talent always will be. So to work in that, in that context and to be able to pump uh, information, interesting news down to those individuals to get them to go on a learning journey to build their capability and skills and then to think about product knowledge and um, promotions and latest updates, that is all a content consumption piece. And what we, what, we, what we were able to do here was actually measure who was consuming what and what that meant in terms of their um, sales performance. And we saw a uh, in the first two months of this project being out a 6% increase in sales. But one of the key challenges was the offline piece because actually individuals in emerging markets don't tend to have data cards. They have smartphones that are Wi-Fi enabled, but they don't have data cards and data is very expensive. So that was a, a key challenge. So again, we created this uh, interface on our story share platform that allowed us to cache and sync content to people's devices so they could watch that offline. They could watch videos offline, they could look at data sheets offline, they could read articles offline, and all of that insight and analytics was then cached once they connected to Wi-Fi again. And again, we could get all of that information back. The other key piece here is the multi-language aspect. The fact that, you know, again, based on your audience types, actually, do they know English? Because um, a lot of a lot of companies do assume that English for, is our business language, and therefore everybody's going to understand uh, everything. Well, if people do not speak English, then they will need content in their own language. So being able to manage the content and the distribution of that content in those multiple languages was absolutely paramount. And to do that easily through a content management system and a platform that allows you to federate control of translations to local audiences to then be able to push that content out locally was something that we, we factored in. So I, I'm aware that we're, I, I've, I've been talking for, for 40 minutes and I did just want to wrap up and see what, what questions we have. But these are, my, these are my final thoughts, is really there is no one size that fits all inside the organization. Despite what we might think or what IT might think, we need to nuance our content and our experience based on our audience types. And in our experience, you're gonna get far better usage and adoption of any internal communication or engagement or learning channel if you make your tech fit the audience, not the other way around, because then you've got a huge change management activity on your hands. And most importantly, you've got to be able to manage that content at scale. I think some of you might be from small organizations that are growing. You're still going to have a content management at scale problem. You're still going to have people in various uh, um, far-flung areas of the globe, and you're still going to have that translation aspect. And that is all about effective management of content at scale. So that's me done. I'll open the floor for any questions. Great. Wonderful, Rob. So just a reminder, we actually do have one question which has already come through. Um, okay, this is uh, an interesting one. So, question is from 
Tom, um, and he's asking, how would you recommend getting to a more qualitative understanding of how content is consumed? So basically some kind of retailing continuous feedback loop, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you recommend um, with that question? So, I, I, and, and I can only really talk, well, I mean, I can talk about other types of content, but digital content, especially if you have the right content management system in place with the right analytics or the ability to then uh, download uh, who, uh, how that content has been consumed within your organization. And the way you know that, by the way, typically is if you integrate or if any platform that's uh, deployed inside your organization is integrated into your active directory, which is effectively your HR and people record that allows you to then get single sign on, you then get that employee record into that system and you can match up the content to that employee record. That's where in the back end, you start to get all of that data and information about what is being consumed, when, on what device. But we always recommend actually getting information out of or, or data, if you like, out of your uh, any content management system that has a good analytical platform in it into uh, BI tools that probably already exist inside your organization. And the reason we recommend this is because this is where you get the combination of data and information around your employees. If you have it in disparate systems, you're going to have information all over the place and you will not be able to combine that. The most interesting thing for me over the next 10 years is going to be how we combine all the information we hold about our people and their behaviors into a single platform so we can then start to really understand their behaviors their trends, what they're doing, and only then will we be able to give rise to things like AI and the next generation of how we then serve up information and suggest things to people and just-in-time learning. All these things are predicated on that single or, I guess, this big data view of, of, the, of the employee. Now, from a, a print media perspective, and you'll see it on, on trains and in, in airports, they often put a use code X when entering a, a competition or you know if it's purchasing something. Those codes are always so they know who has seen their print media, who has seen something out and about. And if, it, if it's digital screens or if you're doing posters, you can do things like QR codes so people can log on to that. Um, or scan your QR code on a poster and that means that they've actually seen that content and they're starting to engage with it. It's very difficult to measure things in engagement if something's offline, but there are little tips and tricks that you can uh, you can employ. Just building on that, Tom asked as well um, in the same question, how do you measure their experience, especially in terms of their, their relationship with their, their manager or their work environment? Is there any way you can do that Measuring their experience in terms of their relationships. Or in terms of how content is, is consumed maybe from those sources. I, I think, yeah, so, so I think you can, get the, you can get the quantitative aspect. So how long someone has watched a video for, when they dropped off, how long they've watched an article for, what buttons they're clicking on, if you've got the right system in place. I think what's then interesting is what that individual does with that content. So um, we tend to put a lot of actionable features on our technology, things like like buttons or share buttons or comment buttons. So we can start to get a bit more sentiment um, and a bit more of an understanding of what that individual then does with that content. So if they share it with colleagues, for example, um, you know, who, who's that going to? What, who are they actually sending it to? Are they commenting so we can get a bit of actual sentiment and their, their reaction to that content? Um, uh, like buttons, so whether they actually liked it or not. Um, and you start to then, uh, I guess, track that behavior. Um, I, hope, I hope that's answered your question some way. Uh, uh, Tom, I don't know if there's anything else, uh, anything else there. Well, I'm gonna ask a question. Um... Just before I do, anybody else has any questions, please put it in the, the Q&A box and I'll put it to, uh, to Rob. Um, first of all, thank you for mentioning the Goonies. Um, it's been <laughs> quite a while since I put them in, in, in Google search, but uh, yeah, they're always on my mind. Um, how, how does it work? You know, you mentioned measurement and, and that's always something that we're pushed to do more and we need to do more in the industry. But how does it work when it comes to dark social? Because everybody is using platforms like Telegram and WhatsApp. 
Now, you know, they're, they're fantastic uh, channels in terms of content amplification and, and you know, pushing out material, but how do you then, is there a way anyway to measure? We, so we have come across some interesting technologies that are used by companies like Nestle to analyze social platforms that are out there. Um, so there's a, there's a tool called Radian 6 that effectively analyzes um, social sentiment effectively from all different social media channels. So you can deploy um, uh, these types of tools within your, uh, within the, the kind of the marketing space and social channels that exist outside, but you can also do it internally. So you can look at what people are saying and it will start to aggregate different themes and different buzzwords. And you can start to then see people's, again, people's reaction to content. Um, I think it's quite difficult to, um, to analyze private channels. So things like WhatsApp and what people are saying. I, I know there are um, organizations out there currently that are getting funding that are looking at deploying uh, WhatsApp monitoring systems for corporate WhatsApp. Um, although actually WhatsApp's, uh, in their terms and conditions, you've got to be careful because it's actually illegal to use WhatsApp from a business context, even though everyone does and they can't stop it. Um, it's not, you can't, you're not meant to, but I know people do. Um, it's very difficult because you can't, and this is why you need to encourage or, or provide the right tools for people to do their job. So things like WhatsApp internally, and there's companies like Yapster that do this very well, so that you can have that overview. As soon as you allow people to use stuff that's a bit rogue, that's a bit, um, you know, they go and select it themselves, you lose that that oversight, you use, lose that overview. And that means that you're you're giving that piece of information away to another company that sits, you know, probably in America, and you're giving that information to them. Um, so, so providing channels again, and this is this is why you don't want to lose people to WhatsApp. Providing the similar functionality internally that's easy to recreate or, or, or get from the, the variety of organisations that exist out there, you can then have more control. So there is no no easy way of of, uh, of doing that, Alex, in the in the kind of the external sphere, because um, things are, tend to be locked down. Any other questions before we we close this up? One thing I will add, uh, Rob has kindly offered to share his email. His email is, oh, Rob, you know better than I do. It's, it's, it's rob.dumbleton at 27partners.com. So if you do have any additional questions on a topic which is very broad um, and can be very complex, you can reach out directly to Rob. So with that, I don't see any more questions coming in. Uh, I want to say thank you very much, Rob. Uh, for your time today. It's been a great webinar and um, we, we appreciate you being here and, uh, and join us for the, uh, for the next time around, which is next week, uh, talking about going from content, digital content to Brexit. You know, what a transition. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rob.